بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا We continue on with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah We left off at ayah number 108 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أم تريدون أن تسألوا رسولكم كما سئل موسى من قبل ومن يتبدل الكفر بالإيمان فقد ضل سواء السبيل Do you want to ask your prophet as well just as Musa, Moses was asked prior to you guys as well. Okay? You want to ask your prophet in the same way that Musa alayhi salam was asked, وَمَنْ يَتَبَدَّلِ الْكُفْرَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Whoever wants to switch iman, replace iman, trade iman for disbelief, فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ That person has become misguided in the path. He's missed the direction. He's missed the path. What's happening over here is that the people of Musa alayhi salam, the Yahud, the Jews, the Banu Israel, they would ask Musa alayhi salam of a number of questions that would all be for the purposes of an expression of their arrogance, an expression of their denial of what Musa alayhi salam was bringing. They were not asking because they wanted these signs. A lot of them, we've already discussed them. They were not asking because they wanted these signs. They were asking because they didn't want to believe. So when they're talking about the baqarah, the cow, they're not asking Allah Azza wa Jalla about how this cow is and what color the cow is and give us more details on it. These questions are not at being asked by Banu Israel to Musa alayhi salam because they actually want to know. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is they simply want to deny this obligation in any way which possible, any way possible. So they keep asking questions to delay the practice and implementation of the guidance of Allah. So Allah says to the people of Medina who apparently had believed, who also started to ask questions, He said to them, that are you asking your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just as Musa alayhi salam was also asked by his people as well simply to deny so you're playing delay tactics with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is one way of looking at it meaning this is a, an address to Muslims but another way of looking at it is that this is not an address to Muslims but rather it is also an address to the people of the book who were also asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specific questions like Allah tells us in the Quran, يَسْأَلُكَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ أَن تُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ كِتَابًا مِّنَ السَّمَا The people of the book, they ask you, O Muhammad, to reveal a physical book to them from the heavens. They said, some of the people of the book, that the Torah was given in a physical form to Musa a.s. Why is it that your book that you claim to be from God is coming to you in an audible format? and not in a written physical copy. So go and ask your Lord. And actually, they don't, they don't even say that. Their audacity is such that they're not even saying, go ask your Lord. They're saying, you go ahead and reveal to us a book from the heavens, from the sama, that is a physical copy. So they're asking the Prophet to reveal, even though they know the Prophet is a human being just like them. He has been given a task to deliver the audible message, the uh, message that he heard from Jibreel alayhi salam, who heard from Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. That was the duty and task of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He can't, he doesn't have any say in what is to be revealed and what is not to be revealed. That's up to Allah completely. And Allah said, they're asking you to reveal, فَقَدْ سَأَلُوا مُوسَىٰ أَكْبَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَقَالُوا أَرِنَ اللَّهَ جَهْرَ they are, they're asking you such a question now. In the past, they'd asked Musa alayhi salam something even more serious. They said, Arina Allah hajara. Show us Allah azza wa jal clearly, out in the open. Let us see Allah. This is the question of the Israelites. 
So the people of the book, they're asking the Prophet of a question and Allah is reminding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that what they're asking you even though they shouldn't be doing so because it's not up to them to de- demand from a Prophet. The Prophet is granted by Allah and he brings whatever Allah wishes to give. They can't become picky and choosy but don't forget this is their habit. Before that, they asked Moses already something that is a lot more serious than this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. And he said, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ كُفْ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ فَاعْفُوا وَاصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Allah says that the people of the book, they love, not all of them. He said, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ A lot of the people of the book, not all. Some of them don't have this wish. But a lot of them do have this wish. And this is Allah speaking. So understand that this is not me, Abdul Wahab, making accusations here. This is Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, speaking. I'm only explaining what Allah is saying. وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ A lot of the people of the book, they love, not just wish, they love to see you, لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا To see you disbelieve after you have become a believer. They want you to disbelieve. They want you to fall. Especially those people who have recognized that what you're doing is the truth. There are people when they recognize the truth, they accept the truth. But there's another group of people that when they recognize the truth, they become jealous of the person who has that. And Allah says, حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ This is out of jealousy because of what, what they've seen you with. This is jealousy in their own souls. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ All of this is happening after they've recognized the truth. So this is not to all people of the book. This is one very particular group of the people of the book. The one who recognized that you are on the truth. That Islam is in fact the truth. A group of them, the majority of them, they end up seeing you on the truth. But they don't want to accept the truth. Because sometimes it's very difficult to bite that pill and say someone else knew it better than I did. Someone else had it right all along. Because you think that you are right and when you're told eventually that you know what, you've got it wrong. Sometimes ego can come in your way. And this is the biggest question in, in life. If that can happen in small issues where an ego stops a person from accepting the truth in day-to-day matters, what about the issue that is the most crucial matter in life? Salvation on the Day of Judgment. So it's only natural that some people, they, many people as Allah says, and Allah knows what's inside of the hearts. Many of them, those who see the truth, they're going to deny it because they're jealous. Especially of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. In that time, even more so. Why is that? Because the problem that they had was that prophethood had left their progeny and their lineage. So they were jealous that their cousins end up getting the prophethood. Allah continues, مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقُّ فَعْفُوا وَاصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ Forgive and forget until Allah brings His matter. What does this mean? Allah tells us in another ayah that you're going to hear from the people of the book a lot of harmful things. Adhan kathira. You're going to feel and receive from the people of the book adhan kathira. Harm, which is a lot, a lot of harm. And there is harm that happens, isn't it? From Islamophobes. Just today we had the brother from NCCM telling us about all of the cases that have been happening all across Canada and in Edmonton as well. It's no different. So there is harm that you're going to feel. And so Allah is saying, فَعْفُ وَصْفَحُ Forgive and forget until Allah brings His matter. Now, what is that matter? In the early phases of Islam, Allah had told the Prophet ﷺ, Forgive, forget, no retaliation whatsoever. But later, Allah told the Prophet ﷺ, as he became stronger, that now it's also time to retaliate as well. 
So how do we reconcile between these verses which say forgive, forget, and then and they're going to come out throughout the Quran, inshaAllah, if Allah allows us to continue, inshaAllah. So how do we reconcile between verses that are telling us to forgive, forget others that are telling us to retaliate as well? The way to reconcile that is that you forgive and forget when you have the upper hand. You do not allow yourself to be subject of oppression. You fight back. That oppression, until the oppression stops, when you get into a position where you have the upper hand, then you say, okay, I've pardoned you now that you've learned your lesson. But you don't just let oppression happen because if I let oppression go and the next person lets oppression go and the third one, what's going to happen? The oppressor will begin to feel more empowered and able to oppress even further. Maybe you let it go because you could bear it, but then another person is going to be subject to oppression because you let it go and they can't bear it. So you have to fight back so that you can protect the weak. And that's how you reconcile between verses that are telling you to retaliate and others that are telling you to forgive and forget. So you do a little bit of both. You retaliate until the person says, okay, you know, I understand this guy is not weak. I have to stop this and cut it out. Then when that happens, you say, okay, I'm glad you learned your lesson and I let the rest of my rights go. Right? This is where you, the, the forgiving and forgetting comes in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْفُوا وَصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Because as of yet, verses related to retaliatory measures had not come and not been revealed. This is prior to those revelations. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Allah is capable of all things, everything. And what's interesting is Qadir is a superlative word. And that's why every time or almost every time in the Qur'an, it comes with, regularly in the Qur'an, it comes with kul shay, everything. Because it's very capable, not just capable. Allah is very capable of everything. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٍ Establish your prayers and give your zakat. And whatever you present from good, you will find it with Allah Azza wa Jal. تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ You're going to find it. Allah will have it there for you. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٍ Allah is all seeing of everything that you do. Allah can see those things. So now Allah goes back and tells the believer, believers to establish the prayer, the basics of Islam, give zakat. What does establishment of prayer mean? Obviously this is going to come up again and again. So I'm not going to explain it every single time, but it's basically establishing it with all aspects of the prayer. The obligations of the prayer, the sunan of the prayer, making sure your wudu is done right. Even better, perfecting the wudu that you're doing. Making sure that if there are sunan qabliya or ba'diya, you're also participating them before and after your prayer. Wa'atu zakat, giving zakat. How can you perfect your granting of zakat? The way to do that is to get rid of that feeling inside of you that had I only not given this. Because it's not yours. When zakat is due, that money is no longer considered yours. Give it while your nafs your soul is happy with that grant. Don't feel like, oh my God, this portion of my wealth is being taken away. That's how you give your zakat. Allah says, whatever you grant for yourselves, because when you pray and you give your zakat, you feel, sometimes shaitan makes you feel like I'm doing this for Allah, for the deen. No, you're doing it for yourselves. Allah doesn't need you. Allah is al-ghani, he's sufficient of all things. So when you're doing this, it's a pre present for yourself. You're presenting it for yourself. And there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is very, very beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that, أَيُّكُمْ مَالُ وَارِثِهِ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ مَالِهِ Which one of you finds the wealth of his heir more beloved to him than his own wealth? So obviously everybody said, that we all find our own wealth more beloved to us than the wealth of our heirs. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, there's not a single person amidst you except that he loves the wealth of his heir more than himself. Why? 
He said, because your true wealth is whatever you give for the sake of Allah. Because that's actually going to be usurped. It's used. It's used in, the, in a positive cause. Now that wealth has gone and established eternal reward for you. However, the money that you keep, if you hoard it and you have it to yourself, till the day you die, technically speaking, someone else is going to be using that. Now this, by the way, doesn't mean the Prophet is saying that don't keep anything for your children. See, the Prophet in every aspect of his life was very, very balanced. You know, when the Prophet would fundraise, he had a very balanced way of doing it. And I try to follow that as well. Why? Because the Prophet wasallam is his sunnah is a guidance in everything. Even in the way the Prophet fundraised. He wasn't very aggressive sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Because the people who are going to be giving, technically they have their needs as well. So when the Prophet is saying this, he doesn't mean by that, don't leave anything behind for your children because there's another hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi teaches the sahaba to leave behind for your children as well. إِنَّكَ أَن تَذَرَ وَرَثَتَكَ أَغْنِيَا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَن تَذَرَهُمْ عَالَةً يَتَكَفَّفُونَ النَّاسِ by leaving your heirs wealthy, it's better for you than for you to leave them behind poor. Then they have to go around asking people for their needs. So there's a hadith over there and there's a hadith over here. What does this mean? That means that you should be granting, but you should also be leaving behind for your children as well. So, وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ And in terms of the Prophet's technique in fundraising, there is a hadith a beautiful hadith. The Prophet ﷺ used to say regularly, tasaddaqu, 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 give sadaqah, give. So he would fundraise. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. But one man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, that I have one dinar. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, tasaddaq bihi ala nafsik. Go give it to yourself. You just have one. What are you going to do? If you give it in this cause, you're left with nothing. Yes, the Prophet does say in a hadith that when you give for the sake of Allah, Allah is going to replace it for you. That is true. But He is also not calling simultaneously to a person completely losing focus of their financial compass. This man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, I just have that one dinar. He said, give it to yourself. He said, no, actually I have two. He said, give it to your children. He said, no, I have three. The Prophet ﷺ said, give it to your servant. He said, I have four. And then he said, now it's up to you. Because you have to fulfill your obligations first. Then you can start fulfilling other obligations. So, because all of that is sadaqah as well. The Prophet told us in another hadith that when you feed your family, that is a form of sadaqah. Whatever you present for yourself of goodness, you will find it by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Inna Allah bima ta'maluna basir. Allah can see everything you do. You don't have to explain to people the actions that you do for Allah. Allah can see them. You don't have to explain to people the excuses that you have for you not implementing something that is an apparent obligation. Allah is your witness and Allah is your judge. And there's a day of judgment. وَقَالُوا Another one of their claims. Whose claims? The people of the book, both Christians and Jews. No one will enter Jannah except for the person who is a Yahudi or a Nasrani. Except for the person who is a Jewish individual or a Christian person. What does this mean? The, Jew, the Jews, they said only Jews will enter Jannah. The Christians, they said only Christians are going to enter Jannah. Now, this ayah doesn't mean that the Jews and Christians are unanimously saying only Jews and Christians will enter Jannah because Christians don't think Jews will be saved on the Day of Judgment and Jews don't think Christians will be saved on the Day of Judgment. They, each of them, they believe themselves to be the recipient of absolute salvation on the Day of Judgment. So every group is separately saying. The Jews are saying, we will be the ones who will enter Jannah. The Christians are saying, we will be the ones who will enter Jannah. Tilka amaniyuhum. These are simply their false hopes. They're dreaming. They're dreaming that they're going to enter Jannah. This is just the false hopes of theirs. Qul hatu burhanakum. 
إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, bring your proofs if you are truthful. Now let me ask you a question. After you read this verse, can you take home from the Qur'an the message that the Qur'an is a book that is salvifically pluralistic? Everybody gets to go to Jannah? Is that a message that you could take home after this? They are saying that no one will enter Jannah except for the Jews and or the Christians say these are just their false hopes. Can you understand from this that everybody can go to Jannah? But there are a group of people who distort some ambiguous verses in the Qur'an and they say, and we've covered some of them already, and they say that the Qur'an is a pluralistic book. It is telling you that everybody gets to go to Jannah. The Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, they're all going to go to Jannah. But no, that's not the case. The Qur'an has a central message, the crux of the message of the Qur'an. There is no message in Islam without this message. The central message is that those who believe in Allah, in the prophets of God, in Muhammad, they are the ones who are going to Jannah. This is the crux of the message of the Qur'an. There's no way you can change this. If you don't understand this from the Qur'an, then there is a literary gap within your abilities and reality. This is what the Qur'an is saying. You have to play a lot of gymnastics to understand otherwise. That's why Allah says, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ Bring your proofs. إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If you are truthful, bring those proofs. Allah wants to make people used to bringing evidences and proofs. Qur'an is full of proofs. Islam is full of proofs. We are a nation that is taught to demand evidence. Right there, the Prophet is being told by Allah Azza wa Jal, tell the Jews and the Christians, bring your proofs and your evidences. And the Prophet told us in another in a hadith, he said, لَوْ يُعْطَ النَّاسُ بِدَعْوَاهُمْ And this is in judiciary issues. He said, لَوْ يُعْطَ النَّاسُ بِدَعْوَاهُمْ لَدْعَى رِجَالٌ أَمْوَالَ قَوْمٍ وَدِمَاءَهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ الْبَيِّنَةَ عَلَى الْمُدَّعِي وَالْيَمِينَ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْكَرُ If people were to be given by simply making claims, then there will be people who would claim rights to the wealth of other people and their blood as well. But rather, anyone who makes a claim has to bring an evidence. وَلَكِنَّ الْبَيِّنَةَ عَلَى الْمُدَّعِي Every claimant has to bring a proof. If you claim that Yahud and Nasara are the ones going to Jannah and nobody else, okay. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Let's look at the evidences. Let's look at the proofs. بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمْ Because their proofs are so weak, Allah doesn't even bother stopping at them. He says, بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ Surely the one who submits his face for Allah Azza wa Jal. What does that mean? Submits his face for Allah. See, one of the most honorable limbs that you have is your face. Right? You can... Let a person go if they come behind you and they, uh, they slap your hand, for example. If they slap you on your back and they're just trying to be friendly, you can let that go. But if someone comes and they slap you in your face, what would you do? You're not going to let that go very easily. No matter how the person explains it, this will be irritating and you will feel irritated. Why? Because the face is... To you, a sense of honor. People take honor in their face. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the person who's willing to submit his face to Allah, let alone everybody else, everything else. He's not just willing to submit other parts of his body, which you wouldn't have a problem if someone violated a little bit. But the face, because it's the portion of your body that you show to the world. And that's the reason why the Prophet ﷺ forbade also from hitting the face as well. So this face you submitted before Allah, i.e. everything else as well. If the face, you have the willingness to submit that to Allah, everything else is obviously the necessary consequence. Lillah, for Allah, wa huwa muhsinun, and He is excellent in the actions He does as well. Falahu ajruhu inda rabbihi. That person will have his reward from his Lord. Wa la khawfun alayhim. 
وَلَاهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And there is no fear upon such people and nor will they ever grieve as well. Now the, the idea here is that they were saying Jews and Christians are going to go to Jannah. Allah says, no, 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 no. no. The people who are going to go to Jannah are the ones who are willing to submit their faces before Allah. They're willing to put it down and prostrate before Allah. They're willing to metaphorically submit it to Allah Azza wa Jal as well by accepting all of the guidances of Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. By practicing all of the obligations that Allah has made. By avoiding all of the prohibitions that Allah has made as well. Now Allah says, فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ That is the person who really has reward by Allah. You guys, you think you're going to Jannah? You don't even have reward by Allah. Because you're, by your disbelief, you wasted away all of your deeds. وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ and there's no fear upon them and there is no grief as well. And this idea of fear and grief coming together, it comes together in the Qur'an at least 10 places, again and again. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون ألا خوف عليهم ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا So again and again it comes خوف and حزن Fear and grief. Why? Because those two, those two things, they actually do go together. If you think about people who are depressed, Oftentimes you'll find them afraid of things as well. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, neither will these people have fear, they will have no state of mental illness. They'll be completely happy, they'll be glad, they won't be sad, there won't be sadness in their lives, nor will they be afraid. Neither will they be afraid in this life, because they have tawakkul upon Allah azza wa jal. Nor will they be afraid on the day of judgment, because Allah has a great reward for them. وَلَاهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Neither will they have grief as well. Now, I looked at the verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَاهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And there are a lot of them, as I said, over 10 verses in the Qur'an. And if you look at the theme, it's always around people who have taqwa, people who believe, people who uh, do righteous deeds, people who pray salah, give zakat, people who spend in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some of the verses, we've already studied them as well earlier on in Surah Al-Baqarah. And here is another one. So, what does this mean? This means that when you do good things, it affects your mental state. It has a positive effect on your mental state. You become a more stable human being. This doesn't mean that a person who does goodness may not be subject to clinical depression, for example. It's possible. But the likelihood is a lot less. And statistically speaking as well, those who believe, usually, if they are adherent people, Islam or otherwise, they usually do end up being less affected by these mental disorders. Why? Because the, the void in their lives has been fulfilled by a, a, a being that is a higher being. So that void has been fulfilled and that affects a person positively. Now, for us, the Qur'an has an even greater effect on your mental health. It makes you happier, it makes you glad, it makes you more stronger as a person, it decreases fear within your life because you start to learn to fear none but Allah. These meanings, they get established within your heart such that that effect of fear and grief and sadness and all of these things, they slowly dissipate and they leave. Because you have belief in Allah. You understand that there's nothing to be afraid of when you have Allah. You understand that there's no need to be sad because everything that happens within your life, it's because of the decree of Allah. And you understand that Allah is the ever wise. So the ever wise will always make wise decisions. You understand that Allah is Rahim and Latif as well. So when He's making those wise decisions, even if they look on the outside to be difficult, pills to swallow and it look to be difficult scenarios that you've gotten yourself into or that Qadr has gotten you into but in reality there's some ease waiting for you so when you understand those meanings the fear goes the grief goes as well I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve us and all those suffering of fear and grief as well Ameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in